Videotaping today is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Fund of the U.S. Department of the Interior through the Nebraska State Historical Society and the City of Lincoln, a certified local government. Our speaker today is Ed Zimmer. Ed is the City of Lincoln Preservation Planner, a position that he's held for 28 years. Before coming to Lincoln, Ed was a freelance architectural historian in Boston. Um, Ed is native to Omaha, Nebraska and has an undergraduate degree from Lindenwood College and a PhD from Boston University. Ed's talk today is titled Francis W. Fitzpatrick, Artist, Architect, Author, Advocate, and Athlete. Um, please join me in welcoming Ed Zimmer. Thank you. The subtitle of this talk could be, So What? And Why Are We Talking About Francis Wilford Fitzpatrick? And hopefully by the end, we'll at least be able to, I think I'll take a vote as to so what. And maybe you'll have an idea why. I think he's a Nebraska figure of a sort. Um, this talk comes out of work I've been doing with David Murphy um, at the Historical Society for their wiki on Nebraska architects called Placemakers, Arch Placemakers um, Nebraska Architects. And this is a figure that we came across in some of that work. And I'll try to make a case for why he should be included. But that's what you'll vote on is, is whether um, Nebraska should or can claim him at all. There would be other A words we could add to that list, but not that I would put on a postcard. <laughs> We'll start back with George Berlinghoff, because that's how I got into Mr. Fitzpatrick, um, who was that very significant uh, German-born, German-trained architect, came to America in the 1880s, worked in Omaha and Council Bluffs and Beatrice, and then finally um, had a major contribution in Lincoln from about 1903 until his death in the 1940s. Um, and that's his obituary picture and his slogan from a 1928 advertisement. The duty of an architect as I see it is faithfulness to his client first, last, and always. I desire that my work shall stand long after I am gone. Mm -hmm. Lovely sentiment. Berlinghoff was well trained before he came to America and in his early work uh, when he was a draftsman for uh, Mendelssohn and Fisher in <coughs> Omaha, um, this was the kind of drawing he could produce and it was published nationally in the um, American Architect and Building News, 1886. This was the Katy House in uh, Nebraska City. And it has, if you get it very close to it with a magnifying glass, his signature as the delineator of this view. So we know that Berlinghoff was a very capable um, draftsman in his own right. On his death in 1944, he left some body of work and his widow, Anna, um, donated a number of renderings to the State Historical Society in the early 1950s. Um, and this would be one of those renderings which we think is from George's own hand as a monogram down in the lower right. Seemingly a fanciful house. I don't think we've ever seen this in Omaha or Council Bluffs or Beatrice and certainly not in Lincoln. Um, but a very capable draftsman. Um, of these uh, highly polished watercolor renderings. Um, and maybe one of the best examples we have is Thayer County Courthouse in Hebron. Um, excellent in his depiction of the building. His figures and his horses may be a little weak, which would seem irrelevant till I show you Mr. Fitzpatrick. This is that wonderful courthouse in Hebron. Among the drawings that Anna Berlinghoff gave to the Historical Society uh, were a number of renderings that don't seem in George's own hand. Um, this uh, very spectacular view of a corner apartment house uh, with fashionable people in the foreground and lovely cars and a fountain in the front. Um, and it has, to the lower right, uh, well, we know this house. Um, it has Berlinghoff's name across the bottom, and this, at least in a related version, is an apartment house, a four-unit building 
that Berlinghoff built in his late years, his house was the one just south of it, and then he and Anna moved into the corner building uh, in his uh, last years, the 1930s. This was built about 1931 at uh, 21st and Washington. But if we look back at the drawing, it gives us Berlinghoff's name as architect, but down in the lower left has also a signature, Fitzpatrick 25. Um, nothing more than that, but this isn't from George's hand. It's his design, I assume, and it looks like a Berlinghoff design, but the watercolor, the rendering itself, is by a different artist. So we set about to try to find out who is Fitzpatrick, Mr. or Ms. Fitzpatrick, and started looking into um, a Canadian-born architect of the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, Francis Wilford Fitzpatrick, born in Montreal in 1863. Early on, his first architectural work that we can find, he's um, up in Minneapolis as a very young man, only about 20 or 21 years old, uh, working for L.S. Buffington, um, not the publisher of a blog, um, but a prominent Minneapolis architect who will figure in his story quite a bit. Um, goes on to partner with Olive, Oliver uh, Traphagen in Duluth uh, in the 1890s and then becomes an assistant to the supervising architect of the Treasury um, in the late 90s in Washington, D.C., although his main assignment is working on the post office, huge, huge project, post office in Chicago, uh, designed by uh, Henry Ives Cobb. And then finally, about 1903, separates from the supervising architect's office and begins a career as a, what he calls a consulting architect based originally in Washington, D.C., and also the executive secretary of a new group called the International Association of Building Inspectors. And you'll notice Nebraska is not anywhere on that list. Um, trying to pin down whether this is the right Fitzpatrick, because uh, it's not the most uncommon name in the world. Um, you find that F.W. Fitzpatrick, who usually styled himself professionally, uh, listed among his services that uh, focused on his work as a consulting architect and limited himself to plan problems, fire prevention, design and artistic rendering, working up of perspectives from designs either made in collaboration with architects or solely of their own conception. So we know he advertised, this is a 1914 ad, um, from the architect and engineer of California, even though he's in Washington, D.C. He's offering his services as a professional renderer. And then focusing down on him, we find uh, him publishing things uh, in many, many magazines. This was out of Fireproof magazine of 1905, which turned into a little booklet. He called the article, A Chat with the Ladies About house building, and he's trying to convince families to build totally fireproof houses by appealing to the women to convince their husbands that this is how they should build. And he provides this rendering of his idea of an ideal townhouse, um, presumably for a large urban center, um, and down at the bottom signs it Fitzpatrick. And if we match that up to our 1925 Fitzpatrick seems pretty comfortable that we're dealing with the right Fitzpatrick. Besides which, I couldn't find any other one. Um, it's, there may be a lot of Fitzpatricks, but not very many architect Fitzpatricks. I did find a Mark Fitzpatrick, but no other FWs or Francis. So I think we're on the right man, and so then try to build what was his career, what was his practice, and can we figure out anything about these beautiful drawings that he did for Lincoln, Nebraska. Find that that artist, one of his A's, is easily covered by his renderings. Uh, he's trained as an architect and works in architect's offices. As far as an author, I found so far over 200 articles that he published in the trade magazines of the day, Inland Architect, Fireproof Magazine, um, American Architect and Building News, Architect and Engineer of California, Western Architect. If somebody published, he published in it. 
but also the popular press of the day. He was um, an avid writer to the newspaper letters of the editor in any town he was in. Uh, he published in the Cosmopolitan magazine, which is a very early American magazine that doesn't look on the covers like it does now, but same, it is descended from the same. Uh, in the magazine, um, Architect and Engineer of California, in 1919, he wrote a piece about the ice palaces he helped build back in Minneapolis when he was uh, a youngster in the 1880s. Um, this is his rendering or his drawing of one of those ice palaces that um, Minnesota was fun in the winter if you knew how to have winter fun. Um, I think that's the beginning of the uh, Minneapolis St. Paul Ice Festival that goes back all the way to the mid 1880s. Uh, also found articles about him as a tennis player in Minneapolis and in Washington DC and in uh, Omaha when he finally gets to Nebraska much, much later in his career. And supposedly, <coughs> upon his um, last days in Evanston, Illinois, in 1931, he was crossing the street to the Northwestern University campus, tennis racket in hand, when he was struck by an automobile, fatally. So, athlete throughout his life. His work with Buffington, um, would have been a great introduction. Buffington uh, ran a large office in Minneapolis, had something like 30 draftsmen. Later on, uh, Fitzpatrick would reveal that he was the lead draftsman in that office when he was 20 years old. Um, Mr. Buffington was not there to contest him at that time, and I think all the other architects might have, but uh, he worked on the uh, West Hotel for Buffington, 1884 which there in the drawing, I don't think this was his rendering. There are actually finer renderers in the office than Fitzpatrick in those days. Um, Harry Ellis, or Harvey Ellis, uh, was particularly a spectacular draftsman. Uh, but that hotel was built uh, much as it had been drawn. Um, he separated from Buffington in the late 1880s. Uh, there's one published account that a new hotel that had gone up in Grand Forks, North Dakota in 1889, the Dakota uh, Hotel, uh, designed by St. Paul and Grand Forks architects, was decorated um, by the um, by a Minneapolis Minnesota Decorating Company and that the, grand, the general manager of that company, Mr. Fitzpatrick, oversaw the decoration himself. So he had some period there um, working between offices that he's apparently working as an interior designer. And Buffington, in the years um, while Fitzpatrick was in his office and soon after, um, immersed himself in a controversy that lasted the rest of Buffington's career and also um, leaked over into Fitzpatrick's a little bit as to whether Buffington was the inventor of the skyscraper. And this is Buffington's patent drawing for the concept of a tall steel structure um, clad with uh, masonry on the exterior but a self-supporting steel structure, and uh, this one depicts it as something like 25 or 30 stories tall. Um, later on, Buffington sued builders of skyscrapers for violation of his patent and lost all of those suits, but our very prolific Mr. Fitzpatrick got into um, newspaper and magazine arguments about what Buffington's role had been. He kind of claimed that if Buffington had had any grand ideas about skyscrapers, they came from his 20-year-old assistant, Fitzpatrick, but mostly said Buffington didn't invent the skyscraper. It arose spontaneously from many minds solving, you know, in an American fashion, solving the problem of a tall building, and in his own writing debunks the thought that uh, Buffington or any individual alone invented it. However, while he says clearly in his own writing that he didn't invent the skyscraper, many others writing about Fitzpatrick later, his friends, maybe his drinking buddies, all said, and we know he was the inventor of the skyscraper. So I'm not sure what he said over his cups. Um, a 1912 article in the Washington Post said that many contend that the inception, the invention of the steel frame, the skyscraper, was F.W. Fitzpatrick's. And in 1918, Omaha World Herald uh, 
writing about Fitzpatrick, said he is widely known throughout the United States and Canada, not only as the architectural inventor of the skyscraper, but as special architect to the United States government for many years. Um, I don't know where they got that, but about the only place they could have gotten it was from Fitzpatrick. His years in Duluth with Traphagen were maybe his most productive as a conventional um, architect designing and supervising instruction of buildings. Uh, Traphagen was very well established before Fitzpatrick got there, but Duluth was very wealthy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, and they accomplished major projects. This was Chester, is Chester Terrace, a row house um, of 1890. Um, this is Piedmont Court, or more often known as Munger Terrace, 1891-92. Uh, this is a published design uh, from a Washington Herald of 1908. Fitzpatrick often wrote criticizing the um, dullness of row houses in Washington, D.C., and then lo and behold, somebody gets a hold of a Washington Herald reporter and tells him about this beautiful row house that they had seen in Duluth, and isn't it so lucky that the brilliant architect of that lives in our own city? Um, I don't know who could have tipped off the reporter either and provided a drawing of the building, uh, but uh, this was uh, Piedmont Court, which was a spectacular building, and as published in the Washington paper said, looked more like a grand hotel, uh, didn't look like a row of monotonous buildings, but rather a, a, a grand statement as a whole, um, and I think that certainly is true. Traphagen's own house of 1892 um, that both Traphagen and Fitzpatrick are credited with. This is also in Duluth. Um, the uh, Lyceum Theater in Duluth of 1891. And they also accomplished a skyscraper of its day, uh, the Tory Building in Duluth in 1893. Um, and this is a drawing signed at the bottom, uh, Traphagen and Fitzpatrick. Um, and that building um, soon is dwarfed by even taller buildings of the 20th century, but um, did, I think, I believe is still standing um, in Duluth. And then together, uh, Traphagen and Fitzpatrick and a St. Paul architect, Bassford, um, compete uh, in the state capital competition in Minnesota and take third prize uh, with this neoclassic design. Mr. Trapagan decides that he has to um, leave Minneapolis, maybe he wasn't, or Duluth, maybe not having enough fun in the winters um, for his health and chooses instead a different climate and goes to Hawaii. Um, this is the firehouse, Duluth firehouse number one that Traphagen and Fitzpatrick had designed. This is the Honolulu Firehouse that Traphagen designed in 1901. Um, maybe had been transformed by the climate. Um, Traphagen becomes a significant figure in his subsequent career uh, in Honolulu. And occasionally, Fitzpatrick, in his very broad writings, would comment on events Hawaiian. Um, the, uh, it may have been through that Traphagen connection. I don't know that he ever went to Hawaii, but he certainly took an interest. Uh, moving on to his, the next step in his career, um, leaving Duluth, um, Fitzpatrick takes a job with the supervising architect of the Treasury, and the system in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was that the Treasury Department was in charge of all federal buildings um, and typically they were designed out of the, the office in Washington. This was a unique building in that it was the first one that the supervising architect hired a special architect to design the building. They called him a special architect, which wasn't Fitzpatrick, although later accounts would make it sound like it was Fitzpatrick. Um, it was a very prominent Chicago architect named Henry Ives Cobb. And Cobb was hired for this one building, which was a mammoth building and uh, foreseen as a multi-year construction. Um, Cobb eventually is fired before the completion of the building. It seems that Fitzpatrick's role was as his first assistant. Um, so a very significant role on a very major building. Um, 
not the designer, but he was the renderer of this published view uh, because down, well, this says um, Henry Ives Cobb, architect, very properly across the bottom, off on the right margin, there is Fitzpatrick's signature as the renderer of this grand view. And Fitzpatrick wrote about this building frequently in his um, subsequent career, um, talked about the fireproof construction, the decoration, clearly was very intimately involved um, to the point that his friends later thought he was the designer and said so. Um, building was completed, um, does not stand any longer, has been replaced, but it was a mammoth <coughs> neoclassical building basically built on a cruciform plan with then the corners infilled at a lower story level. So it filled a whole urban block um, and really held that position even as taller buildings were constructed around it. I wondered with his drafting skills and his rendering skills whether Fitzpatrick wouldn't have done other buildings for um, the supervising architect. The supervising architect published lovely annual reports illustrating the many buildings around the country, post offices and courthouses, custom houses um, that the office was producing. We found one single rendering by Fitzpatrick. I think he basically is working in Chicago, working on that uh, mammoth building. But he did do this um, spectacular rendering for uh, the St. Paul um, Courthouse Post Office. Uh, which properly was credited to James Knox Taylor, the supervising architect at the time, same architect as designed the original portion of the, uh, what we would call the old federal building in Lincoln in 1905. Um, uh, Taylor had uh, served in that role from the late 1890s through the early 20th century. Um, but we also have Fitzpatrick's signature uh, down with the uh, troops marching off to um, Spanish-American War, I believe. But we also see, very typical of Fitzpatrick's renderings, the street scenes are as lively as the building. And the um, virtuosity of his watercolor, um, that he can create this whole marching uh, wave of troops with just little, little brush strokes. And um, then always wants to throw in the dogs, the horses, um, and the, the costumes of the day. One of the articles he wrote um, that was not architectural was about women's fashion. Um, he wrote a long piece about women's fashion through history and around the world um, with his own illustrations. Uh, and that building was built. This is the other view of it. Um, and that is the side that I think he's depicting. And probably rather than saying that he exaggerated the rendering, um, I think they couldn't quite afford the whole building. And if we just shrink that tower down, um, it really is about as built taking out maybe 100 feet of tower or so. Uh, we find uh, while he's still in the supervising architect's office, um, he begins publishing uh, quite broadly. Uh, this was um, an article he wrote about the building he was working on, so it makes it um, quite fitting. This was an inland architect of 1900. Um, and he would provide not only um, the renderings of a whole building, but the illustrations for an article and pretty clearly even the uh, calligraphy of the script. And he signed it below Chicago's federal building with his signature. I mentioned he didn't only write on architecture. He wrote on everything. Um, he also had a patent on a uh, flour milling process, apparently back from his Minnesota days. But this was in Cosmopolitan um, of 1898 in a series they called Great Problems in Organization. And with a co-author, he wrote on flour and flour milling. Uh, just very broad interest. In the write-up that I'm preparing for the Historical Society's wiki, I think I can call him a polymath, which is, he wasn't Leonardo da Vinci, but he was very good at a broad range of things. Not as good as he thought he was, maybe, but some of them he was. I think he was a spectacular renderer. Uh, and this from Cosmopolitan 1901, um, it's not his poetry, it's Florence Radcliffe's, but 
he draws the little Cupid figure um, beside it and probably illustrates the, um, the whole poem. I'm not sure where the word the keyed into the last line comes from. It reads much better without it. Um, but I don't really want to read this poem. It's not that good. But there's his FWF. Mr. Cobbs, the special architect working on the Chicago Post Office, um, gets um, a foul of the Washington office. The building was proceeding very slowly. They were building it with steel interior but granite walls and each block had to be individually hand tooled and the progress apparently was indiscernible some years and Cobb was also maybe imprudently shifting his office from Chicago to Washington DC and the supervising architect fired him and with him just before uh, Cobb was fired. The two lead assistants in Chicago, including um, Fitzpatrick, resigned. Uh, and I don't know just what that was about, and the accounts of it are very uh, sketchy, but it seems like they left of their own accord, but um, things weren't going well at the Chicago Post Office, and uh, they all went out about the same time. Uh, right about that time, Fitzpatrick's interest in fireproof construction, which I think we could find evidence of much earlier, becomes very strong and a, a new magazine begins to be published out of Chicago called Fireproof or Fireproof Magazine. Um, not a bit subtle in its covers or in its point of view. Um, it's a little hard to s quite see, but here I think the devil is um, burning a building that the Grim Reaper is holding out to him and it says on it, Mill Construction. This would be the heavy timber construction that um, industrial buildings were often built with of the day on the theory that they would stand up while they were flammable, they would stand up a long time while you'd have a chance to fight the fire. Sometimes worked, including examples in, in Lincoln, sometimes didn't work at all, including examples in Lincoln. But Fireproof Magazine took a very strong stance um, in favor of steel over concrete <coughs> construction. Um, and brick and terracotta cladding of all the steel elements. So that they were advocating for and carrying the advertisements of the companies that produced all the materials to build a steel building, but then encase every steel member in fire-resistant terracotta cladding and terracotta arches to carry the floors, metal windows with wire glass, um, the least amount of in combustible material inside the building as possible to the point that not only did Fitzpatrick recommend steel instead of woodwork but um, asbestos faux woodwork in your building so you'd reduce as much as possible any flammable materials. And he wrote almost every month for Fireproof magazine um, and wrote articles on fireproofing in all of his other journals and then was re-quoted time and again widely um, in newspapers of the day. He worked a um, calculation that America was losing um, 500,000, 500 million dollars worth, half a billion dollars worth of property a year to fire. Whether that was accurate or not, it was just the kind of figure that the newspapers would pick up and it was published widely quoting him principally as the executive secretary of the International Society of Building Inspectors. That, I believe, was a basically lobby, lobbying group in Washington advocating for the adoption of fire codes and building codes across the country. He clearly traveled in that job. Uh, there are newspaper articles from all over the country about uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick coming to town, looking over their fire code, looking over their buildings, consulting with their fire department, always praising the fire department and condemning their codes seem to be what occurred in almost every town and also widely condemned the insurance industry because he felt that um, they both didn't discount enough the rates on fireproof buildings and their standards were the minimum but everybody built as if they were the perfect standard and so that he found fire codes and insurance to be abhorrent and argued that sprinklers shouldn't be installed and that 
Fireproof buildings ought to carry no insurance because they were fireproof. They would be perfect if built to his, to his specs. Um, some of the other kinds of things he was writing, um, he wrote on ancient Egyptian art, um, quoting a German scholar whose name I'm almost certain was made up. Um, he just threw a lot of vowels and consonants together to form the scholar's name. Um, wrote on city planning issues. This one was um, reproduced in a uh, book called Town Planning in Australia, uh, where he was recommending that tall buildings, it's a little hard to see here, but to the right is the street at the street level. To the middle of the view, cutting across diagonally, is the street about 30 stories up. So his notion was that you'd build kind of two tiers of city um, for your tall buildings, and you'd have a surface level and then um, automobiles up, up at a higher level as well. Uh, the caption that the Australian book provided was, how an American architect, F.W. Fitzpatrick, would solve the problems of tall buildings and their stability. Uh, it's a little unclear exactly how this was a solution, but um, he was wrestling with those problems of the day. Now, how he gets to Nebraska and how he's drawing for uh, Berlinghoff can't answer for certain, other than he did a lot. If we look at his advertisement and if we look at his own descriptions of how he saw himself, he described himself as a consulting architect um, and wrote a piece um, answering a criticism from an English author that consulting architects were just ghosts. They were the invisible figure who was designing a building and then hiring a bunch of disconnected people to actually put it up and nobody was taking responsibility. And he said that was not his own practice at all, that he did employ a group of specialists um, for the plumbing, the structural work, um, and he offered his services either to assist the overall architect um, or if they weren't as good at design as he was, he would do the design work for them and they could supervise the construction wherever they were. Um, he says, <coughs> The work's done by specialists, but all conforming to the general scheme laid down, working harmoniously together and to the one end of supplying a perfect, well-balanced entity. And reassured architects that if he, can, if he cannot, if he feels at all dubious about himself, why can't he employ someone for the artistic part of the program? So I think what he wanted to be doing was having people send him their problems and he would produce a sketch and send it back. Later on when he talks in terms of building code, he's a lot less charitable about his fellow architects. And he says, when he wrote a model code, I, would, I might have been less exacting if I'd been in the act, a, active practice of architecture instead of consulting advisory. 25 years of the latter work, the constant revision of other architects' plans, the checking over their contemplated and executed construction, the inspection of buildings burned or collapsed or sinking or proven a poor investment, have made me a bit pessimistic about the discretionary ability of the average practitioner. Um, must have been a little difficult to work with um, if, if you were bringing him your problem and he was telling you how very, very wrong you were. Um, but as far as I can tell, his broad practice and his, his contribution for the Lincoln architects really seems to be that high, high skill he had in rendering, in presenting their plan in a polished form. The earliest rendering we find connects us nicely back to this building because um, George Berlinghoff had the commission for the Nebraska State Historical Society building that was to be put up at 16th and J just beside the Capitol on what's now called the Senator's parking lot. And this was um, Berlinghoff's pretty well known um, perspective for that, but this is not Berlinghoff's hand. This, this is Fitzpatrick's hand um, in the presentation. I think it's Berlinghoff in its design looks very much like Berlinghoff's courthouses and um, other neoclassical buildings, but um, has that, love, that lively street scene, um, the rich imagination of the buildings in the background in Lincoln, Nebraska um, that we know from Fitzpatrick. This would be about 1909, that's when construction started. They built the basement, and that's all that was built of this building. Um, among the drawings that Anna Berlinghoff uh, 
gave to the Historical Society and clearly from Mr. Fitzpatrick's hand is Lincoln High School. Um, under design in the early teens, um, construction began in 1912, and it doesn't exactly look like Lincoln High School, but if you stand back and line it up, it really is, other than the red tile roof, quite a faithful um, rendition of what is built, except for maybe the cars in front. They don't show um, the computer services van in the proper fashion. It is interesting that there's a little ghostly suggestion in the rendering on the far, far right of a church steeple. In 1912, um, First Plymouth was not yet there till the late 30s, but he's putting right on the proper hillside um, a church spire. Some of the Lincoln renderings that we can associate with Fitzpatrick don't survive or aren't known to survive and aren't in the historical size hands. This is a popular postcard that we often see of what was called the Commercial Club building. Predecessor of the Chamber of Commerce, it's where Crane River had the restaurants, where Misty's is today um, at 11th and um, P Streets. And this was the grand version that Berlinghoff and Davis, after they joined together in partnership in 1910, um, designed for the Commercial Club. And it had all of those lights and the cornice and all the things it no longer has today. And it had this spectacular rendering reduced to a postcard now um, that has all the earmarks of a Fitzpatrick. There was a published version of that same image giving us a little more of the scene. Um, and it includes Fitzpatrick's typical inscription across the uh, lower right, Lincoln Commercial Club, and credits Burlinghoff and Davis as it should. The automobile coming towards us, the one that's about to strike the artist on the uh, left-hand side, he often liked to point a car at the front of the scene with the grill showing, and quite likely on that grill, you can see just kind of a shadow of something written diagonally. There was no such thing as a Fitzpatrick automobile, <laughs> but in many, many of his renderings, the brand name of the car coming towards you was Fitzpatrick. And if we ever find this hanging somewhere, I think we'll see Fitzpatrick on the grill of that automobile. Uh, that was published um, in a Rotarian publication of 1914, um, not identifying the architects, but um, celebrating um, one of the great buildings just finished in Lincoln. And they also published one of the grand buildings of 1914-1916, um, the Miller and Payne, also by Burlinghoff and Davis, had done the two-story corner um, and then added the eight-story tower. And we have our inscription across the bottom and our car charging towards us. Let's see, I think it'd be the one on the right-hand side in this instance. And we can't quite read it. But this one does survive in Lincoln, still is in the hands of the descendants of the Miller and Payne firm, used to hang in the real estate office even after the um, architects, e even after the conversion of the building into offices. And I know that years ago I read on the grill of that car, Fitzpatrick. And I've got to get a big color picture of it again. But I've wondered since I saw this drawing 25 years ago, who was Fitzpatrick? And I think now I know. That was as published in the Rotarian of 1915. So the building would have still been under construction. Um, we find Fitzpatrick um, doing some large renderings of, of grand events. This was the preliminary layout for the Southern States Expo in New Orleans, uh, published in 1913. He was listed as a consulting architect um, to a New Orleans firm. And that was a project that did come about, whether he had any involvement beyond the rendering and um, distant consulting. Uh, I don't have any evidence. So I think I can also associate him with this drawing of Santa Clara University, principally because W.D. Shea, the architect, uh, was among his patrons in California. Um, on Fitzpatrick's death, the obituary that um, architect and engineer of California published 
talked about, um, his friend in California, Mr. Shea, particularly feeling the loss of his talents. And this is Shea's signed work for Santa Clara University, and I think must be a Fitzpatrick, has all the earmarks. I'm trying to bring his career together during his Lincoln years, Many of his drawings for Burlinghoff or Burlinghoff and Davis we can associate with specific buildings. Howard County Courthouse um, of Burlinghoff and Davis, 1912-13. Uh, with, I love the, the folks in his scenes. I think that's his idea of a country rube or maybe a country lawyer. <laughs> um, but that is Howard County Courthouse. Does a couple drawings for Burlinghoff and Davis of um, campus scenes, one to be the city campus, one to be the farm campus, and this is a grand one he labels for the city campus. If this got built, I've missed it. Um, and I'm not even sure what project they're competing for. These may be some of the kind of competition drawings that I think was a specialty of his, um, but a very grand building with a, a almost ziggurat top and a big clock tower at the top of it. Um, but credits it to Burlinghoff and Davis, but um, certainly is a Fitzpatrick scene. A few of the buildings um, don't seem to result in actual buildings or they're reduced grandly as they're built. University Place did build a high school, better known as Jackson High, during the period um, that Burlinghoff and Davis are active together. And this one is labeled up on the building, University Place High School. The actual building constructed, well, the other, on the grill of many of these cars in the renderings that still survive, there's a diagonal rubbed out. So I think Berlinghoff got on to him. And um, <laughs> there was some jealousy about whose name was on the drawings. And so there's a scuff mark on several of these drawings on the grill. Um, this is what, um, high school looked like, and I think if you look at the, the fenestration and, the, and the, the center door, it's a reduced version of uh, what was in that rendering. Another building that looks like a school building but um, doesn't have any identification as to what school and can't connect it directly to a, a Lincoln school, um, but for Burlinghoff and Davis clearly. <coughs> feels a little bit like the Ferguson house off to the left, but it's not. Um, so, and usually the background, the edges of the Fitzpatrick renderings are totally imaginary. I'll show you one that's not. Uh, this clearly was a competition drawing. Burlinghoff and Davis were among the listed competitors for the McLeod Hotel. Uh, I think this was, yes, the McLeod Hotel was built in York. Um, they didn't pick this drawing, although I th I'll show you what they did pick and you'll wonder why they didn't pick this drawing. The little building to the left-hand side, kind of the two-story <coughs> with the, the curved front, um, in the actual rendering, the name of the proprietor on that building is F.W. Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Can't quite read it in this, but that's Fitzpatrick. This is what was chosen and built um, for the Hotel McLeod in York. Uh, you won't recognize this county name, I don't think, unless you know Arizona real well. They competed for um, a courthouse project in Arizona, did not get the project. Another neoclassical building was built, but here they're using um, Fitzpatrick's skills for that presentation drawing. Um, how you would resist wanting your town to look like this, building aside, you know, they should have chosen the other building and then had the streetscape done by Fitzpatrick. So he's doing this work for Burlinghoff and then Burlinghoff and Davis while they're together um, up to about 1917. 1917 also sees a shift for Fitzpatrick from Washington to Omaha. And he comes to Omaha to work for a firm called Bankers Realty Investment Company. 
They had started in about 1912 in Omaha building houses. They were a stock company, um, and you would invest your little bit of money. Their advertisements were, why should only the rich guys get richer? They can do it because they can pool their money together. We'll pool your money together and build, and we'll pay 7 or 8% a year, and it's perfectly safe, and it's a grand idea. And we'll do all of the parts of building instruction. We'll buy the land. We'll design the buildings. We have the contractors, the engineers. They were a vertically integrated construction business and construction investment business that produced some significant buildings in particularly 1915, 16, 17 period, including the Blackstone Hotel in Omaha, uh, which is under construction um, about 1916, 17. This is a published view of it finished from an article that Fitzpatrick wrote soon after coming to Omaha. He calls the article uh, Building Activity in the Midwest, but really it's a promotion piece for the uh, Bankers Realty Investment Company. Um, and the Blackstone is on the National Register. Bankers Realty and Fitzpatrick are credited as the architect. His title with them was head architect or head of the architectural section. I don't know if there was anyone else in the architectural section. Um, exactly when he came to Omaha, I've not been able to pin down. It's, and whether he's helping design this from Washington before he moves out or quite how that works uh, isn't perfectly clear. By 1918, he's been made a director of the company, and that's where they published that, he, that their new director invented the skyscraper. Um, that article is lavishly illustrated with photos of the Blackstone as built. Blackstone was kind of a combination. It was more a residence hotel, um, a grand, grand apartment building, than a transient hotel. Um, this is one of the parlors, um, the tea room, the ballroom, and what they called the Oriental Cafe. And there were articles in the World Herald saying that Fitzpatrick had particularly designed the interior of the Oriental Cafe with the help of his young daughter, Frances, um, who was about 17 or 18 when the family moved to Omaha. He and Agnes had had eight children. Um, he designed a grand hotel for Grand Island, um, which was built as the Yancey, um, not quite as elaborate as his drawing, but uh, clearly the same overall design. He depicts in that article a hotel that the um, North American Hotel Company would build in um, Sioux City. And as far as I can tell, this did not happen. World War I did happen, um, a rise in construction costs, a real shift in uh, the investment climate, and the company of which he was now a director and probably investor uh, hits very hard times. They were going to build a Blackstone in Kansas City to be twice as big as the Blackstone in Omaha. It did not seem to come out of the ground at all. They did build some small hotels in some other communities, um, and some of those were um, disasters for them. In Scotts Bluff, they had competed to build the big hotel in town. Another competing company built the Lincoln on land that um, Scotts Bluff had provided them for free. Fitzpatrick's company went and built anyway the Bluffs Hotel, which was never finished until it was completed as a hospital um, in the early 20s. Both hotel companies, the competitors in um, Scotts Bluff, both went bankrupt in the late teens, early 20s. Um, this is his Fitzpatrick's rendering for the St. Regis Apartments in Omaha, also about 1917, and apparently his design, uh, which was built and is still a very, very fine uh, apartment complex. Designed for a bank building that, as far as I can tell, did not occur, and a Masonic temple. Um, and this was, they, they intended to become a regional construction company, and this was in Riverton, Wyoming. Uh, and it was built about 1918. In 1920, we find in the Omaha directory that Fitzpatrick is no longer listed with the uh, Bankers Realty Investment Company, 
but is listed with the Owl Art and Art Supply Company. And then in the 1920 census, we find him um, in the Chicago area, living in a boarding house with Agnes and 20 other folks. So I think he's hit very hard times um, with the events in Omaha. But he is commissioned in 1922 to build the Johnston Memorial in Wallace, Nebraska. A very unusual building. It's a community building for the town. Uh, Mr. Johnston was a, ga a glass industry um, man from Pittsburgh and for his health had been recommended to find another climate for vacations and for decades he went out to Wallace, Nebraska to hunt and fish and much loved the area and they much loved him and on his death his friends back in Pittsburgh including the president of Pittsburgh Plate Glass, PP&G, um, headed up a building committee, hired Fitzpatrick, uh, who's no longer in Nebraska, he's now in Chicago, but it had connections in his East Coast work with um, the Pittsburgh magnates, and they pay for and build a Johnston Memorial in Wallace, Nebraska, which is on the National Register in a very um, nice building, maybe the last um, direct design by his hand by John, by Fitzpatrick's hand, um, is this little community building outstate Nebraska. We still see some production through the 20s for Burlinghoff. Burlinghoff and Davis have now separated. Davis is going to go off to partner with Wilson and be Davis and Wilson and build everything that didn't get built in the teens. Um, and that company still exists as Davis Design. Burlinghoff does significant work in his own right after splitting with Davis, um, including courthouses and other buildings. And this rendering looks like a Burlinghoff courthouse, except we can't quite line it up with any Burlington, Burlinghoff courthouse. But Burlinghoff did design for um, a Presbyterian church um, in Schuyler, Nebraska, this design, which looks a lot like the commercial club in Lincoln and looks a lot like that rendering and looks a fair bit like a courthouse. It did get built looking a little more ecclesiastical with the split entrances and the stained glass windows. Um, it was built some years, a few years later, um, but it would seem like possibly that rendering becomes the church design, becomes the church um, through Burlinghoff's hands. And then this drawing which is labeled George A. Burlinghoff Architect uh, and shows a very grand Gothic Revival office tower. And this one, I think, was for downtown Lincoln, was not built because we can tell what corner this was on. If we look at the little scrap of a building depicted on the left edge, that part, blow it up, we can see on a marquee the letters OLN, Right beside the cor in the mid block between 12th and 13th on the uh, south side of the street was the Lincoln Theater, or L-I-N-C-O-L-N, -L Lincoln, Lincoln. And it had on its end walls um, that kind of Flemish stepped curved parapet. He's actually depicting a specific Lincoln corner. It happens to be the corner where now Davis Design has their office in a 1960s office building. Um, but he's clearly designing this building for that corner. It's about the time the Sharp Building is built a block further east and whether he's competing. I've never found anything that tells us there was a scheme to build a grand tower on the 12th and end corner, but that's clearly what he's depicted. And so we'll come back and finish on the drawing that kind of got me started. Um, in his last years, um, Fitzpatrick seems to be producing the renderings in, from Evanston, um, still writing some articles, writes a few summaries, looking back at his 50 years in American architecture. And he was quite a insightful writer about the major architects of his day, was an admirer of Louis Sullivan, thought that Wright got it wrong, um, said that of all his followers, 
they sinned and the greatest sinner was Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, admired Richardson, but thought his buildings weren't very practical, but had quite a modern viewpoint back on the years of architecture he'd observed in, uh, in his career. Uh, he gave us a few more renderings, this one and the building that actually resulted with that great street scene. And then published an article in 1928 that he illustrated with four of his own renderings of a Chicago tower, a San Antonio church, which was built, um, not by, these are clearly renderings he's doing for other architects, um, an Oklahoma City telephone building, which was built, and a Roman Catholic girls college in Philadelphia, which was built. Um, and so he continues in that consulting architect rendering um, work throughout his lifetime, ends up with obituaries in the California paper magazine that he'd so often published in, which repeated all of those exaggerations that they must have gathered over the many years, and then had a final kind of postscript by William Gray Purcell, who was a very prominent educator and prairie school architect who had known Fitzpatrick back in the 1890s, back in Chicago, um, and admired his work um, and said of him, I found him a most entertaining, versatile, and capable architectural fashion expert, as practical as plastering on the French Renaissance sugar as any of the pre de Rome boys from Paris, and with a profound respect for Louis Sullivan. So with that, we'll leave our Mr. Fitzpatrick, a national figure, international in his own mind at least, but with, I think, some very handsome contributions to our local scene as well. And with that, I'll take questions, but I think we're just also about out of time. Thank you all.